recognize the fact that Massachusetts is a, is a fairly um, unique situation in terms of its leadership in the education and work, workforce space. So this next panel, led by Steve Lesky, um, is going to talk about some of the uh, accomplishments and challenges um, that have happened in the Massachusetts, um, in, in the state of Massachusetts, as they they do continue to lead the country in terms of achievement. And I know some. Uh, number of the panelists feel like we, they need to keep keep moving further far ahead, but it'll, it'll be a great conversation. So, Steve, where are you? Uh, come on up. Hi everyone, um, as Deborah said, my name is Stieg, and uh, I got a call from Deborah, and she said, Stieg, you're not gonna be on the panel. You can't talk, you have to moderate because the moderator didn't show up. And I didn't really know how to take it. This happened like five seconds ago. It's possible that I was the last on and the first out. But I have less to do and the lunch is really good. So here we are. Um, uh, I am not going to introduce the panel. We don't have a lot of time. They're in your book. They're great. Um, we have 40 minutes. I will finish with 10 minutes to go, and you can ask questions. <clears throat> um, and the topic, as Deborah said, is pre-K, K-12, higher ed, and educational workforce in Massachusetts. Um, we're going to limit the first 15 minutes of comments to K-12. Uh, and then after that, we'll come back around and talk about higher ed, educational workforce, and pre-K. And I have one simple question for the panel in both cases, which is, what, um, what is the evidence? What are the examples of genuine progress, genuine progress, genuine innovation in the K-12 system in Massachusetts, in your opinion? And with that said, where are also genuinely described the barriers and the deficits? Um, and I'm going to improvise and have you start, Joanna, if you don't mind. And we're going to come down this way, and then we'll go the other direction for the second half. Uh, Joanna Jacobson, take it away. Uh, hi. Uh, so. Originally said that I was going to end because I'm I start as Debbie Downer of Massachusetts. Uh, if you look at the data and uh, I run a very fact-based organization, uh, Massachusetts uh, has made uh, in the NAEP test, which measures states uh, equally across our nation. In the NAEP test, uh, Massachusetts has either stagnated or declined in their results over the last 10 years in every single tested subject. Uh, and if you think about uh, that uh, and you follow the trajectory of our growth scores against the other states' growth scores, by 2021 we will be passed probably by New Jersey, but there's lots of other contenders uh, in this space. But if you think about what's happening to our students, uh, our parents and our educators, and the whole political spectrum, I think uh, Arnie kind of summed it up very well, which is there's a massive complacency and there's a tremendous amount of adult dysfunction and everybody's running away from improvement. Uh, and the best uh, example of that complacency is nine out of every 10 parents across our nation believe that their children are on grade level. 33% of children in America are on grade level. And in Massachusetts, we're almost hitting 50%. I don't know how we have a competitive economy uh, in 10 years if we continue in this way. Uh, and the real problem is that we are 31st of OECD nations in math. Uh, we are 22nd in English, and we are 19th in science. So uh, I would say that I am less bullish. I think that one of the problems here in Massachusetts, there are a lot of very interesting innovations going on because we have some spectacular leadership. But the ability to replicate and scale that takes a tremendous amount of um, 
desire and need. And when you look across the country, some of the most innovative places, it really took a crisis in order for change to ensue. Uh, so I put that aside saying that I think it's really important to be pretty realistic about where we are. Uh, the things that give me hope, uh, uh, some of the work that uh, we're involved in is on applied learning, which someone raised in one of the earlier sessions. Uh, and applied learning is something that solves a tremendous number of problems uh, because of the way uh, it deploys rigor in the STEM sciences. Students learn rigorous content and then they immediately apply it to a real world problem. Uh, we are scaling right now across our state uh, one of these interventions, it's called Project Lead the Way. Uh, it's K through 12, it's applied learning for all students in those disciplines. Uh, the best example I can give you is you walk in a 10th grade classroom the first day of biomedical science and there is a dead body on the floor. Uh, and students spend the entire year in deep, rigorous biomedical science content to ascertain why that person died. And it's not a murder. Uh, and you talk to the kids in these classes, typical 10th graders, it is their favorite course. They say it is the hardest course they have ever taken and they're all gonna be biomedical scientists. Uh, and what applied learning does is, is it combats the anti-rigor component in our country, which is teachers worry that rigor stresses out students so they dumb down curriculum. If you look at the data, the greater the rigor, the better students do. The second thing it does is students are engaged, they're not bored to tears. Over 68% of students are bored to tears every day in their schools. The third thing is you're kind of end running the teacher content issue because we spend time actually pulling teachers over the summer, putting them in boot camps. They're learning how to be facilitators of this work, not the content deliverers. And then you get at those power skills, right? The entire curriculum is critical thinking, complex problem solving, uh, working in teams and communicating. Uh, and that's really important because kids actually fail in this course. The work is hard. They learn that actually failing is fine. They work in teams and they persist and then they figure out uh, these complicated solutions to problems. And the last thing that's great about it is it's tied to industry. Kids don't know what you guys do. They have no idea what the careers of the future are gonna be, they can't imagine it. So we actually work to get companies involved in this. They uh, are the judges in all competitions statewide, regionally, and schools. Uh, and we run virtual challenges where kids are actually uh, sending in their virtual uh, projects which are being judged by companies. And so you're getting this virtual cycle loop that allows students to see themselves uh, in jobs in the future. So I would say that uh, for us right now, we're at 35,000 students across Massachusetts. Last year we were at 20,000, next year we should be at 50,000. Uh, and so hopefully the applied learning component of this work uh, can deliver real results for students. Thanks. Um, so I'm Vanessa from New Profit. We're a venture philanthropy fund um, that works nationally, so a lot of our data isn't uh, based on the state, although I will later give an example of a state project we're doing. Um, and I'm gonna respond a little bit, uh, just reflect on 20 years of investing in great Point Solutions, amazing social entrepreneurs like Wendy Kopp from Teach for America and Stieg uh, when he was with Match and Duet and other uh, great leaders like Europe and Leap and many of these great social entrepreneurs we've invested in over the last 20 years have um, are innovators and have scaled across America. But I think a lot of what we've been reflecting on at New Profit, and it relates to this panel, is the discussion about ecosystems. Like, it's just impossible to look at a problem and just think about the one point solution and not think about all the aspects. And so I'm happy to sort of be ending this conference talking about a state, because the state is the workshop for the kind of impact. And I don't disagree at all with what Joanna's assessment of where we are, but I think the reason we are where we are is because 
we always pull one lever or two levers, but it's really a matter of putting a set of levers together and pulling them all at the same time. And so I think you need the innovators um, and the evidence-based practices. That's certainly a huge part. That's what we've been focused on for 20 years. You need the risk capital and the philanthropists, and I think in Massachusetts we're lucky to have probably one of the highest rates of innovative philanthropists. You also need the outcome-based government dollars, and that's an area where I feel we have a lot of work to do. Most of our government dollars go to inputs and not to outcomes, and it's very hard to do those kind of negotiations. But the fourth leg of the stool, it's a four-legged stool, um, is, um, is really proximity, community, and when I look at the amount of philanthropy that has gone to sort of um, supply-side solutions, and if you compare it to the amount that's gone to demand-side, in other words, say, student organizing, parent organizing, teacher organizing, it's 98% to supply side. And I think as we want to solve major social problems, we have to think really hard about how to engage um, the demand side and the community in the problem solving themselves and ensure that, the, um, that we have solutions that are really working for the communities. I think Arnie did a great job of talking about his vans in Chicago and realizing that you know, it's great to have these vans, but the kids wouldn't get into the vans because it wasn't safe. And, you know, we have to work in concert with those communities. So a lot of what we're doing nowadays at New Profit is trying to figure out how we create innovation and link all these systems and align all the actors in the equation, the innovators, the evidence-based practice, the philanthropists, the government dollars, and um, community voice. And I, I will give an example later, but I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, everyone. Hi, uh, Justin Kang from the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. Uh, uh, in case you're not familiar with Chambers of Commerce, we're not a government agency. We're actually an independent nonprofit representing the business community. Here in Boston, we represent 1,400 businesses, major employers to small businesses. And in terms of this framing of conversation, uh, through my lens, you know, I, I will talk about the cons and the pros, but the biggest con we see is just the major disconnect between uh, employers in the private sector and the educational institutions and workforce development organizations. A stat that we throw out uh, in terms of our argument, and nationally, I don't know exactly, 90 or so percent of employers don't think students are workforce ready, while about 30 percent of uh, higher ed institutional uh, officials think uh, or flip that, sorry, 90% think that their uh, students are workforce ready in higher ed, and while 30% uh, for the private sector don't think students are workforce ready. So it's probably somewhere in between, but as we've hosted a number of listening conversations with both higher ed and workforce uh, and employers, we just see oftentimes both sides sort of vilify each other uh, in terms of what's actually happening. So for us at the chamber, we're trying to bridge that divide. Um, there have been some uh, positive developments here in Greater Boston, especially around engaging the private sector in educational issues. Uh, one thing that I'll point out last year, uh, it's a topic that we don't typically wait, you know, go into, but uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, Speaker DeLeo, came out in aggressive increased funding for uh, early childhood education. Um, and for us as a business community, that's a topic that we normally don't lobby for in terms of legislatively, uh, but it's something that we uh, went uh, went for and ahead to try to increase training and funding for early childhood educators, and that's something that we think is incredibly important. Um, there have been other advances. The city of Boston recently created an office of external affairs to manage corporate relationships before a lot of the public schools in the district were uh, just managing their own. Uh, so it became very disparate and divided. Uh, so having that in-house and under a singular office. Um, and then I'll just point out to um, the, some fantastic vocational tech schools that we have across the state in Fall River. We have the Diamond Vocational Tech School in Worcester. We have with Worcester Tech. Um, those are two tremendous examples where they have uh, students uh, having wait lists uh, to get into these schools, which is rare and we don't see actually in the city of Boston. But they have veterinary clinics, restaurants, credit unions. Uh, so that's an example of where the private sector is really engaged uh, in terms of the K through 12 education. Uh, but ultimately, even though with those progresses, uh, we still see a huge disconnect between sort of the HR employers as well as sort of the uh, K-12 representatives. 
Good afternoon, my name is Jennifer Davis and I'm at Harvard now, but I served with Secretary Dick Riley in the Clinton administration and I wanna go back to a little bit of history about Massachusetts reform agenda. Massachusetts is probably the only state in the country that has had since 1993 a bipartisan commitment to improving public education. There have been significant advancements and new accountability systems. As a part of the 1993 law, there was a very strong um, system put in place, for example, to monitor uh, the charter school sector in this country, in Massachusetts, which is why Massachusetts has some of the highest performing charter schools um, in the nation. So some of the accountability systems that were put in place, um, we have an incredibly entrepreneurial uh, social sector. I've been told we have more nonprofits in Boston than any urban district in America, and most of those nonprofits are very active um, one way or another in uh, the social sector, which has uh, made a huge difference. Uh, a few years ago, our then commissioner, uh, the late Mitchell Chester, um, with the legislature also put in place a strong accountability system in order to be able to take over uh, chronically low-performing districts and schools. Uh, that's begun to show some impact. Uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts is the example that a lot of people focus on. Uh, the fact that uh, the receiver was put in place and uh, was able to focus on the kind of innovations that usually only charter schools can put in place. All of the schools added 200 additional hours to the school schedule, uh, all kinds of changes to uh, the teacher professional development and evaluation system and so forth. And I think we're gonna see more innovations in that realm to the individual schools that are being taken over. And so there are some real, uh, I think, positive things to talk about in Massachusetts, but we have yawning achievement gaps. And I don't know if you wanna switch to the negative. Oh, my, no. that's so great. Um, Susie, thank you. Um, let's, first of all, thanks for staying on time. That's hard to do. Um, let's go back down the line, and I'm gonna give it back to you. Um, same question, keep going, put stuff out, but now broaden out a bit. Um, same question around pre-K, higher ed, and educational workforce. Genuine evidence, genuine examples of meaningful change in progress where it might exist, and also some reflections on where the real barriers and, and hurdles lie in the state of Massachusetts, Jen. So if we can go back down, just keep talking a bit, um, and um, we'll end with you, Joanna, in about 12 minutes. So that's three each, and then we're gonna open it up. So with all of the innovations in Massachusetts, we have not cracked the achievement gaps, particularly between low income and high income uh, communities. We have a lot of uh, wealth in this state, 30 billionaires, do you believe that? 30 billionaires, a lot of wealth in Massachusetts. Um, but we just haven't been able to really take on um, this, this, these gap issues. Some of the work that we're doing at the Ed Redesign Lab, um, I think is beginning to show some interesting innovations around uh, working with mayors and superintendents and health officials to develop strategic plans on how to address the barriers to student achievement that come to students from outside of the school context. So how can we address those issues from early childhood uh, through their K-12 experience and prepare them for higher education or careers along this continuum and pathway and make sure that we have our systems that are aligned and integrated um, so that early childhood is talking to K-12, so that the health and mental health systems are connected to the schools, so that you have career preparation, summer apprenticeship, summer jobs, and a strategy around how to link those systems together in a way that we know we're making sure the kids that need those access to those resources the most are getting them. Those of us with kids, we're making those investments in our own child's educational experiences beyond what schools can offer. We have to figure out in one of the wealthiest states in the country how we can do that for all kids across Massachusetts. Um, in terms of just what's happening here and ultimately I think a positive that's been having our trend that we've been seeing a lot is just dual enrollment programs. I think that's something that Massachusetts is leading on. Uh, the city of Boston has multiple partnerships with Roxbury Community College, Bunker Hill Community College, Wentworth, XBFIT, uh, and Lawrence High School as well in addition. 
uh, has something with North Essex. So that's something that, uh, that a lot of elected officials here are championing. Uh, I'll also say the one thing that we continually should be doing, and that's because a lot of times, you know, what we need to make sure is that I think for 50% of Boston Public School students, uh, only 50% graduate in six years from college. So having that dual enrollment program so that people can start taking classes as high school students is so important. The other trend and thing that we're hoping for more is, you know, ultimately we have Northeastern as a shining example for, um, you know, even for myself, I never get my first co-op choice for my Northeastern student because it's so competitive. Um, and the question is how do we replicate that for every first generation student of color in greater Boston? Um, you know, some progress yesterday, the Mass Life Sciences Center, Mass Bio, um, and other biotech leaders uh, promised 50 paid and meaningful jobs for first generation students of color uh, at uh, pharmaceutical and biotech companies. Uh, that's something that oftentimes first generation students of color lack that social capital to get an internship unless you go to a Northeastern. Uh, so that's a positive development. Uh, and the other thing, just sort of in, in higher education, I just, I love the duet program, I think, that, you know, the, the blending of the flexibility of digital learning and also that sort of on campus uh, career coaching, et cetera, is, is uh, very valuable. So. Look forward to seeing that expand more in Massachusetts. Awesome. Um, I thought I'd just point to one example where I've seen sort of all four of the levers that we're working on work together in concert in Massachusetts, and that's in early childhood. There's been a lot of a big increase in early childhood, federal dollars. You've talked a little bit about early childhood. Um, Aaron Lieberman, who was uh, the very first investment we made 20 years ago, started Jumpstart. Uh, which has now touched 110,000 lives and had an incredibly evidence-based ba back um, effect on those lives. He then left there and started a for-profit company that was an $80 million for-profit Head Start management company. He's now working with a new profit to actually work with all aspects with innovators, philanthropists, helping work with Charlie Baker on creating a new quality rating system, sort of a QRIS system 2.0 that is more focused on outcomes. And um, we're also working with all the community-based organizations. So New Profit is putting up $10 million of capital, risk capital for innovators that have evidence-based practices in early childhood. We're partnering with the state. The state is also putting up $10 million. Our money will be used as growth capital. Their money will be used as sustainable capital. Organizations will, um, we will collectively, we're going to jointly pick the organizations that are funded. The state and New Profit are going to pair together to pick those organizations. New Profit will help grow and build the capacity of those organizations. The state has changed its quality rating system so that those organizations that do best will get more money. And the partnership will be with all the community-based Head Start programs. So we have the community as part of this. We have evidence-based practitioners, we have philanthropists and the state all working together to really change 40,000 li children's lives in Massachusetts in the next three years. So that's the kind of real system change I think we need to do. It takes a long time, it's not easy, but we all need to find ways to work together and align our actions. Uh, the Innovate, the most innovative higher ed example I would use in Massachusetts is uh, s both sitting in this room, which is Paula Blanc from uh, University of Southern New Hampshire and Stieg Leshley, who started Match Beyond, which is now called Duet, uh, which is a competency-based online education and is really, really ahead of the curve and has had fabulous outcomes. But I sort of talked about that, so I'm going rogue and I'm going to Georgia State. I don't know if anyone knows or has heard about Georgia State. Uh, it is the... Uh, it is a complete game changer uh, in the country in student retention. Georgia State's 50,000 students, majority uh, minority students, uh, primarily African-American students and Hispanic students. In their eight years into a 10-year plan, their graduation rate was 31% of students and they've jumped to 53%. And if you look at those students who went from Georgia State to complete somewhere else, they're up to 73% graduation rates of minority students. And the way they did it, it's a lot of things. I'll give two examples, uh, both uh, big data examples. They used big data to eliminate summer melt, which was why students weren't showing up who had enrolled. And they used uh, data to build a bot to respond to students' questions immediately because, shockingly, students asked questions over the summer about 
Like, what do you mean I need immunizations? What immunizations? They ask that at one in the morning and no one's there at Georgia State to pick up the phone. So this bot answered their questions and immediately 33% more students started enrolling and they've been doing that. The second example, which is even better, is they use big data to ascertain 800 indicators of what might make a student fall off the rails uh, and not show up for school. And these indicators run from uh, location services so that they're following where the students are. If a student hasn't been on campus for a certain number of days, it triggers to an advisor to find out where the kid is. If a student gets a C minus on a biology test, we're gonna get that student a tutor. And it's just this massive immediate response. They run the data every night and it bounces to the advisors who assign to the students to take action that has to be taken within 48 hours. And their results are spectacular. Um, we're way ahead of schedule. <laughs> I don't know how to take that either. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna ask you for a question. You're politically astute, all of you, in different ways. Um, can you imagine a concrete development in the near-term future, in Massachusetts or nationally, in the raw political substrate underneath K to 16? The election or not election of somebody, the development of some kind of policy initiative that would actually make the odds of us doing well in this state materially better or worse. So where is the variable in the raw politics of K to 16, if you think there is one, uh, coming. Does anybody, does anything come to mind? What should we be looking for or fearing in the raw politics of this in the short run? My view is the federal government's role in education is over. Uh, we have to focus on the states and state leadership. Uh, years ago, we used to have some education governors. Uh, we need more of those. Um, and hopefully there are more and more bubbling up um, in this new body politic we have in this country. Um, and so uh, I think that the innovation is going to be at the state level and at the local level. Um, and the reason I'm so proud of this particular state is, again, we have a bipartisan, we have a Republican governor working collaboratively with a Democratic legislature on a very major proposal this year to update our funding formula as an example and to put in place some new accountability systems to push for innovation and change. And so we need to see more of that kind of innovation in other states across the country and we need more governors to step up on the education issue. Um, We've been working hard on, on trying to get more performance-based uh, dollars in any government budget that will have us. Um, mostly we've been working federally initially um, and have advocated to get, so far succeeded at $1.7 billion that is now allocated on a performance basis towards outcomes. That's puny compared to the any budgets, uh, any government budgets, but it's the beginning of, I think, a transformation in a time when government is devolving and we have to think about how to use dollars smarter and better. Um, it, in this community, in this room, I'm sure it seems strange to talk about government dollars being used towards outcomes, but that is what we need to do. Um, and I actually think uh, federally in the during this Trump administration, we've been able to make a lot of changes actually because nobody's really paying attention to some of the, the workings behind the scenes um, and we've created a new CIPRA fund in Treasury um, that will have a lot of effect in all the different departments, but I do agree that the game is really gonna be played at the state level and so it's incredibly important that the governors uh, think about you know outcome-based funding, pay for performance, social impact bonds, that kind of stuff, because that's, I think, where the change is gonna happen. Yeah, I don't buy it. I, I, I don't believe government's gonna do anything. I do agree with Arnie that that was a moment in time where they tried to make a lot of change, and I think things go in waves, and I think uh, it's not gonna be the government that changes it. I think the system will be disintermediated by people like you. Uh, I think disintermediation is coming. Uh, I think higher ed will be disintermediated and it will require a dramatic shift of what happens at higher ed. And I think K through 12 is gonna end up getting disintermediated and uh, 
I think it's up to corporations, uh, companies, entrepreneurs to stand up and say, uncle, like we're not gonna take this anymore. Uh, companies have said that. We're actually working with companies uh, to retrain and put people into companies. It's happening both in the nonprofit and the for-profit as we saw in this conference. Uh, but I'm not gonna sit around waiting uh, for, I think the uh, John F. Kennedy, we have to send a man to the moon, which is the moment we need. And that would require dramatically different political leadership in one part of our spectrum, which I can't even imagine anymore. I think, just to add to that point, uh, uh, with, you know, I, I can speak at length to my lack of faith in politics and government, uh, but, you know, I think uh, they're ultimately for systematic changes for, from a corporate private sector perspective, seeing a culture change within our companies and businesses of what talent is and who is talented uh, is, is so uh, imperative in terms of their hiring practices. Uh, so again, for them to consider what degrees are necessary or how they create a job description or how they have their own biases when they interview someone in person, uh, those are things that uh, I do see entrepreneurs like the Skills team here and, and others trying to help revamp and re reinvent, and I think, for our private sector leaders to, again, reimagining who is talented and where their talent pool is coming from. Okay. We have nine and a half minutes. Um, you can all ask questions. I'm even willing to take a question from the man in the back who's wearing a Rams jersey. <laughs> so I feel pretty provoked by that. Um, fire away. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, just a question on uh, after school programs for high school graduation rates. Is there any data? Uh, there's a lot of issues with kids getting out of school and then just doing whatever they do, which is usually not good. Um, has anything been done in the Boston area to, to kind of track that? And <laughs> uh, When I worked for Mayor Menino, I launched a citywide after-school learning initiative, and I think we made huge progress. We numbered, doubled the number of kids in programs, and Vanessa's invested in some of the highest quality programs, and I again, I think Boston is ahead of the curve with regard to the quality of programming. The middle school uh, citizen schools program is one example where kids are actually in apprenticeship programs starting in the middle grades. The data is really mixed on impact and outcomes, and it really depends on what you're looking for. Are you looking to build the new basic skills, or are you looking for core academic improvements? On the core academic side, there's, there's less strong data on alternative skills, whether it be you know, public speaking and leadership and those skills that are important in uh, the private sector, of course, um, I do think we are starting to see, we have seen some positive impacts, um, but there aren't enough. And, and some of my work over the years has been, how can we look at some of the charter schools that have significantly longer school days and years and implement that more fully in a traditional school setting? We've had some mixed results on that. Um, but with those kind of redesigns, which the commissioner, Jeff Riley, made possible in Lawrence, as I mentioned earlier, you are seeing more engaged enrichment opportunities, more partners playing a role in kids' lives, and some positive educational impact because it's integrated very strongly within the school context. That's what you need to see. You need to see that integration to really have the impact you're looking for. In terms of health, exercise, just kids feeling better about themselves, you know, wanting to go to school so they can go to this program, whether it's sports or not. Yeah, so there's been, particularly in Boston, several entrepreneurs that have led very significant um, uh, athletic efforts that have partnered with the school system to push them to expand their offerings uh, for both girls and boys. So I would say, again, Boston is um, probably ahead of the curve with regard to those kinds of opportunities, but our Western communities and others, I think, uh, don't have as many of those options. Um, I don't know if anyone else has um, oh, sorry. We haven't uh, backed the sports-related organizations. I think they, I will say that so many of the challenges is that there's the innovations are there, but they're just nowhere near scaled. So we haven't been able to do the sort of longitudinal evidence-based studies of them. Um, so I just cheated a little bit. I asked somebody if I could ask them a question so that they could talk. So it's a not. 
So we're searching for evidence of breakthrough innovation. Um, so let's go to higher ed. I have this idea in my head that one day a truly branded university, think of the top 10 branded universities in the country, will have the following really simple meeting. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna go on, we're gonna build a web browser and on it people will learn computer programming or basic finance, something technical that we know we can teach online, we know we can assess online, um, and we're just gonna give them a degree, straight up. It's not gonna cost that much, and there's gonna be like 100,000 of them, and we're gonna invite them to campus and put them in a football stadium, and we're gonna move their tassel over, and we're gonna call them Stanford, we're gonna call them Princeton, we're gonna call them Michigan, and you get the degree. There is no hedging, there is no hocus pocus. And it happens to a lot of degrees. In domains where we know we can teach it, we know they can learn it, and we know we can assess it. Um, would that happen? I think you have to look at uh, the graduate program space and the undergraduate program space. And the two are, uh, in terms of where things are, two are quite different right now. At the graduate professional degree space, um, it's happened as we speak. So uh, uh, you can now go and sign up for a fully online uh, degree uh, in computer science from UT Austin for $10,000. Uh, and a top 10 branded school, Georgia Tech uh, in uh, data analytics or in cybersecurity or in computer science for under $10,000. So, uh, you know, I see Phil Regier here, uh, uh, you know, ASU and uh, edX and MIT just did a partnership where there'll be a very affordable supply chain management masters where students will complete the first half on an MIT MicroMasters, and then the second half would be from ASU. So we're seeing radical things happening uh, for, for disruptive prices at the graduate level. An undergraduate degree from the top 10 school, I think it's going to take a hell of a lot longer, maybe even a year or two longer. <laughs> One last curiosity of mine. Yeah. Push it. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, like most of the people in the room, I don't live in Massachusetts, so I want to make sure I understand the context correctly. Am, am I remembering correctly that Massachusetts has more private schools as a percentage of the student population than any other state, and that recently affluent suburbs in Massachusetts voted to limit the number of charter school spaces for uh, poor kids in the urban districts? Am I, am I remembering that correctly, or is that? <laughs> we do a good job. Joanna is going to answer that one. Some of, some of us have been dying to forget that. So um, Massachusetts, I don't know about the private school. That, that might very well be true, but it's a tiny part of the population. We lost question two, which was the charter cap lift. We got our asses kicked. Um, and it was the perfect example of misunderstanding the power of unions. Uh, so the misinformation that went out to the public about the charter cap lift was uh, overwhelming. And the teachers union, this is actually against the law, but nobody took them to task, put misinformation uh, bulletins and handed out pamphlets at parent-teacher conferences. And the teachers union is huge. There's hundreds of thousands of teachers across the state. And, and people trust their teachers. And teachers were telling parents, if you pass this law, uh, which basically said underneath it, uh, only in the 10% worst districts could you open new seats for charter schools and the funding comes from somewhere else, not from the district funding, you lose your library. Your child will not be a, have a librarian. You you won't have an athletic program. You're going to lose teachers, and it it just swirled. And really, uh, the fact base was that in states where a governor is for charter cap lifts, uh, they passed. And Massachusetts was an example of the flip of education of the public sentiment against education reform nationally. It's happened everywhere, and we have, and sadly. It is not politically uh, a good issue for 
any side to be in. So the unions kind of own the Democratic side, don't, don't get you know, that involved in that, and we limit and don't talk about the fact base there, and the Republicans have all their state-based, you know, rights issues. And so I agree with Arnie that it has become an issue that is politically inaccessible. We can do things like talk about money and funding, but we can't talk about results. Can I, can I just re respond to that, please? So I am a huge charter school supporter. Uh, we know each other. We serve on the KIPP board. I've been on for 10 years. In uh, 2015, a report came out that the state was underfunding school districts across the state by $800 million to a $1 billion a year, did not keep pace with the increase in costs, and so districts all across Massachusetts were cutting libraries, were cutting after-school programs, were cutting teachers in some cases. And there was a miscalculation, in my view, with regard to the broad base of frustration in a broad group of communities across the state, not just the unions. The unions, of course, were behind the organizing. If Governor Baker had made the proposal he just made three days ago before the cap lift, I think we would have had a potentially different result. So I'm hoping that there is a bipartisan way forward because there does seem to be a coming together with regard to really investing at the level we committed to do in 1993. I just want to point out, we Welcome to Massachusetts. as a state have the highest per pupil. So Boston, 20,000 per pupil. Like, and right. we still can't get it done. And in California, I think it's 5,500 per pupil. So uh, some of it doesn't make any sense. Um, we did it, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, that's Massachusetts, thank you everyone.